Okay, one last check that you can hear me and you can see me all right. And I'm going to present the mode. Okay, perfect. All right. So I start in a minute. Okay, we're at the hour, so we can start. Um, welcome to uh, this presentation, uh, a large-scale MongoDB migration from to WireTiger. Uh, I hope you are in the right room. Um, it's hard to miss on an online conference. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Antonios Giannopoulos. I'm a database administrator for Axpace technology uh, for the past seven years. I'm passionate about NoSQL and NewSQL, um, and more passionate about Mongo, uh, to be honest. Uh, I work with, uh, for, uh, with MongoDB uh, since 2012. Uh, so next year, it's going to be like 10 years since I started working with that database. And I'm an Octonaut uh, groupie. Uh, my daughter told me that my presentation is pretty boring, Daddy. You should add some color. So I asked her, what should I put there? She said, like, Octonauts, obviously. So you're going to see a lot of octonauts, and you're going to learn all their lines. Uh, let's discuss briefly our agenda. We are going to review quick uh, the differences of MMAP and WireTiger. And at the same time, I'm going to give you a brief uh, description of the environment. Um, our main focus uh, will be on the steps that we run to prepare the transition from the MMAP to WireTiger. Uh, obviously, we're going to cover the migration or transition steps. Which, whichever term you like the, the most, um, and the challenges that occurred after the migration completed. In the end, we're going to have a slide about uh, what are the next steps for this large environment, and uh, I'm going to leave a couple of minutes for questions and answers. Now, why we are discussing in 2021 about MMAP and the transition to wire tagging? Um, so, uh, Obviously, I'm starting with some questions because this is like a virtual conference. So I'll, I'll try to, to cover a couple of, of those that you may or may not have uh, if you read the abstract. I never read the abstracts, so I only read the titles. So why am I? Um, if you're an early adopter of MongoDB, like the customer that we're going to use in, in our presentation today, uh, that they started using Mongo since version, since version 2.2, it's very likely uh, that you have built some trust around them. Um, at the same time, most probably you have built your ecosystem around them, uh, your schema, uh, everything. Change is difficult, right? Not only for like changing storage engine, but it's difficult uh, in general. And the first consideration uh, when you make a change is how stable is that change? I mean, I'm stable right now. If I transition to something new, am I going to be stable? Now, if you switch to Wire Tiger in Mongo 3.0, you must probably ask yourself, did MongoDB invest on the right storage engine? The answer is yes. Wire Tiger as a storage engine is decent, but the integration with MongoDB didn't happen in a night. Childhood diseases are often in a change like that. Uh, remember the early days of InnoDB for those that they use MySQL. As an engineer, I start felt confident for different reasons with wire taggers uh, in Mongo 3.4 and 3.6. One for stability, the other one for features. Um, I believe we all understand that without the wire tagger, we wouldn't have all these great features that we enjoy today in the versions 4, uh, like transactions, for example. Now, why private cloud? Uh, if you read the abstract, we're, we're going to discuss about the migration in private cloud, not public cloud. 
And again, here I'm going to play the card of early adopters. Um, Mongo 2.2 released in 2012. They start using Mongo in the early, uh, on, on their very early versions. Public cloud back then wasn't mature for heavy database workloads. Uh, since then, obviously, there is a tremendous evolution, especially the past couple of years that make public cloud uh, more desirable for database workloads. And uh, spoiler alert, it, it's on our roadmap to use a hybrid cloud solution at some point, and why not a native cloud solution, public cloud? Uh, that will combine, I mean, the hybrid will combine the best of uh, both worlds, but essentially we, we need to, to move uh, to public cloud, with, but with our own terms. But again, private cloud is not as bad as some people think. It's not like the age of dinosaurs. Um, and that if you meet certain criteria. For example, long-term commitments um, can benefit from private cloud because the cost is going to be lower than using public cloud. You, have, you can achieve better performance and you have higher control over your environment as well. Again, I'm not against public cloud. I'm a huge fan. I'm aware of the benefits like elasticity, OPEX, uh, less administration, uh, overhead. But at the same time, I'm an open-minded realist. This is how I like to call myself. Uh, a brief description of the ecosystem, because we, we talked about like a large migration. So we need to define what the large is. Um, so all the clusters are sharded and geographically distributed. The environment has more like 1,000 databases, which are distributed uh, in more than 4,000 uh, shards. Uh, it's not like a single cluster that has like 1,000 databases and 4,000 shards. It's been distributed in different clusters. Now, not all the clusters are the same. They don't have the same number of shards or the same number of Mongo S's. It depends on their workload. The MongoDB version at the time of the migration was 4.0.12. So you can imagine that uh, it happened some time ago. It's not super recent. Now, why we, we moved to Wiretag? Well, first, it's a necessary evil. And I'm Greek, by the way, and Greeks love this expression, necessary evil. You're going to hear that from a Greek like every day. But uh, it's deprecated in 4.0. It's removed in 4.2, which makes it necessary evil. But the truth is that most of new features in MongoDB had stopped backported to MMAP way before that. Um, but again, even if MMAP didn't discontinue, the change to WireTiger is unavoidable. Uh, if you have a modern application, you need a modern storage engine like WireTiger that has numerous features um, required by the modern applications like transactions or chain streams, etc. On top of that, you get better overall performance mainly by the improved locking mechanism that WireTiger has now that it's like better integrated with Mongo. OK, I hope you enjoy the appetizers. Let's move to the main course, which is the actual migration and transition. Now, um, I'm going to start talking about the preparation steps. Um, we talk about private cloud, which means dedicated hardware. Each storage engine, MAP or WireTiger, has different hardware needs. MAP needs fast disks and fast CPUs, while WireTiger will take advantage of more cores, more CPUs, at it, as it supports higher concurrency. Some of the hardware we were using wasn't suitable for WireTiger. Or better, it wouldn't fit the requirements that we had to meet uh, for the WireTiger transition. We couldn't utilize it 100% as we want to. I mean, it wasn't like junk hardware, but not the optimal one. And I say some because the hardware refresh is a constant procedure on a private cloud. Servers come EOL. Um, if you're leasing hardware, uh, it's more beneficiary sometimes to just uh, renew it rather than um, update the lease, uh, et cetera. So we were running that process all the time, but uh, we were running in a smaller scale. We didn't have like to refresh uh, a high number of servers because of, of the transition. Now, even if you pick uh, public cloud, a task like that is most probably, uh, it's something that you most probably need to go through. Uh, you're not going to purchase, obviously, physical servers, right? But 
you will have to probably replace your uh, instances with uh, flavors that they might have like higher compute capabilities and maybe fewer IOPS, something like that. So still you have to replace something. So how did we choose the right hardware and how did we actually evaluate the existing hardware and said that this hardware is eligible and this one is not? Um, for the new hardware, we focused obviously on the expandability of the hardware and more specifically the resources that are more significant when it comes to Wire Tiger, which is CPU and RAM. Uh, the CPU is used for concurrency and the RAM is very useful for the uh, double buffer mechanism that Wire Tiger uses, uh, the OS cache and the Wire Tiger cache. Obviously, we had some prior knowledge that wasn't the first Wire Tiger workload that our team had to deal with. So um, we, we had some benchmarks from the past with, from other uh, customers that they made a similar transition, not in that scale, but uh, we had those. So we knew pretty much what type of hardware we need to look for. Um, so we picked a couple of candidates uh, and usually the vendors give you like a box to play with. Uh, so we run endless benchmarks. We first test the OS, then um, we run a MongoDB generic uh, benchmark uh, that we try to figure out when the line is going to get flat, when you use Mongo that hardware or where Mongo is going to break. And in the end, the most important benchmark was to simulate the exact workload of the customer. Uh, now, we had a little help from them, obviously, but um, we also used a couple of, uh, of tools like Mongo Mirror to, uh, to replay uh, the workload. Um, and for the existing hardware, we ran the exact same steps and we said like, this model is, is good for Wire Tiger, this model is not. Now, after picking and racking the hardware, which wasn't an easy task, it was challenging too, um, uh, we had to shift things over to it. And by that, I mean that we had to move all the shards from the old hardware or non-eligible hardware to the new hardware. Again, that's a task you most probably need to run in the public cloud as well, um, if you are changing flavors, and the orchestration should be able to support it and make it really simple. I mean, you have to predict about that um, in the case of you know, an outage. It's kind of like the similar uh, situation that, that we have here. Um, now, we decided, and one of our team members had a bright idea and that, that member is sitting in front of you now, to perform an optimal placement of the shards to the new hardware in order to maximize what we get from its physical host and at the same time to improve the performance. Um, we used our monitoring software, which by the way is Prometheus, to update our existing profiles. We were making like profiles before that for each like shard, so, so we know where to, to place it. Uh, but now we decide to become a little more, bit more verbose. So we create bunch of metrics like IOP, CPU consumption, statement per second per shard, active connections, um, pretty much everything that uh, Prometheus can support, but we, we kind of pick like the top five that we thought that they're like more, more useful. And we also asked the customer to tell us like, okay, we have a list of you uh, of yours that um, you, 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 you have ordered your instances in a, in a matter of you know, importance for you. Uh, could you please like update that list so we, we use it for the optimal placement? Um, so when that list was ready, we had to decide how we're gonna shift things over. So move, to, uh, move from MAP to MAP or from MAP to Wiretag. So we decided to go apples to apples, which uh, slowed down things a little bit because you need to make an extra step. You move and then you convert, which we're going to see later on. But at the same time, we don't make two changes at the same time, which sometimes that can be catastrophic when you have a change. Um, I, that's one of my principles. I never do two changes at the same time because then I cannot evaluate my change. Um, so we, we use MAP to MAP. And most probably here, you're going to wonder, wait, the new hardware you order it is not suitable for MAP. Um, yeah, it's not suitable for MAP to, large, to run it on a large scale. But if you want to just run a couple of like containers with MAP, it was perfectly fine for it. Um, and the, my, the transition method, the, the, the migration method was like replica set extension or shard drains. These are, these are the two options in the sharded cluster. Uh, replica set extension, just add the nodes. 
and then the, you remove the old ones, while shard drains, you just use the balancer to move the chunks over to the new uh, sharder. That was no brainer. We, we use the replicas as extension because they're more robust and faster. And we always have in the back of our head how we're going to reuse the old hardware, which is a problem that you're not going to have in the public cloud. But uh, we didn't want to, to dispose hardware that had a couple of years uh, of life. So uh, we decided that the, the old hardware is, is really decent for Mongo assets. So we, we started like reusing this. Um, now, each storage engine has its own characteristics. And as much as we want to leave MMAP behind us, we cannot overcome the fact that MMAP is better when it comes to reads and to in-place updates. Against write workloads, these benefits fade. But again, read-only workloads, MMAP is the king. The biggest problem we had with WordTiger is the range queries. Most of you all have faced that in WordTiger. It doesn't perform really, really well because of the internal structures that it's using for those range queries. You can't have everything, right? I mean, right, best, best performance on writes, best performance on reads, and at the same time, you have like minimal uh, space uh, requirements. So why I'm saying all this, this customer was heavily using range queries. And its queries are the worst type of queries that you, a DBA can face, dynamically generated queries. Um, we had done a really good job uh, with generic indexing in MMAP to meet the SLAs, but we figured out that extended indexing was required for the WireTiger transition. Now, luckily, in WireTiger, we don't have to care much about the additional space for the indexes and the locking that comes with them, which was an issue in MMAP the locking especially. So we could deploy more indexes this time without hurting the performance. So we could become like way more specific rather than generic for the queries. Now we had to deal with dynamic queries. So we, what we did, we had to collect a big amount of query patterns. So um, we, we, we kind of wrote like our own utility to do that. So it was going and connecting to the cluster was was grabbing all the, the patterns and was creating a summary for us. Uh, Percona has a similar tool, PT Query Digest, but we wrote that ourselves because it was very like use case oriented. Um, our, our implementation was like use case oriented because at the same time, uh, that tool was running some aggregations to distinct out um, some fields that weren't important based on those aggregations. Now, we had to deal with how we're going to add the hint on all these like, new indexes and all these queries, right? Because when you have generic indexes, you say like generically, like put this index on this query uh, type. Um, we went with something like semi-dynamic hint where the driver tries to pick the best hint. Uh, it runs periodically some explain plans and pick the optimal index for a query and then it reuses, reuses it. Um, we found that uh, index options are really handy, like on dynamic queries, like um, parcel indexes specifically, because those queries had a lot like exist through Boolean flags. We didn't want to put all this on the index. So um, we, we used the, uh, the parcel index. Uh, obviously, we had to deal with the 64 index limitation, um, but also the fact that more indexes uh, means more uh, time to uh, for the planner to evaluate uh, those indexes if you know they they meet the they meet the query patterns, and as we transition to 4.2, uh, we replacing some of these indexes with um, wildcard indexes, which is, which are very handy for dynamic queries. But again, we keep that uh, semi dynamic hint that I talk about. Now we're talking about sharded clusters here alone, not replica sets. So we had to consider how many shards we will need in wire type. Now, in MMAP, we had a high number of shards, which I don't want to define what high means. Uh, but we did that to increase the write scope. Um, we divide this, the, the writes into the shards to get like fewer locking on the shard, so they would like operate faster. Now, in WireTiger, writes are not an issue, right? But the high number of shards uh, was beneficial to our use case because we had range queries uh, that didn't use the shard key. So they were like scatter gathering. So we decided that um, keeping the same amount of shards will like divide those queries into like multiple shards and we're gonna have something like a divide and conquer uh, win scenario. 
Now, after we evaluate the read performance, we decide on some clusters to reduce the number of shards and some cluster to increase. Um, both are expensive operations because balancing is needed. Uh, removing shards is a more expensive operation because um, you have to do it in steps. You don't just decide, I, I remove like, uh, if you have 20 shards, I remove 10. Now, we said so many times that reads are the problem. So the question that arises uh, is, do we need more secondaries to scale the reads? In Wire Tiger, when writes applies to secondaries, they don't block the reads, which speeds up reads and makes like the secondaries good candidates to scale your, your reads. Uh, while in MMAP, it was the exact opposite. Uh, but, and we had to debate with like, do we need a setup now in where Tiger with fewer shards with more secondaries or more shards with fewer secondaries? Uh, we promote the scenario with uh, more shards and fewer secondaries, not fewer. I mean, uh, we use the uh, three node replica set uh, because that scenario also scales both uh, writes and reads. While if you add more secondaries, it will only um, uh, scale the reads. And again, okay, Wire Tiger has an improved locking mechanism, but again, writes goes always before uh, reads. And another consideration uh, before the migration is that do we need to change the shard keys? In, in MMAP, we were using shard keys that uh, they were scaling the writes. And those are like ID hashed or a field uh, that uh, was pretty much close to like uniqueness with, with a hashed. Uh, or not hashed if it was random enough. Uh, changing the shard key is challenging, right? Um, and sometimes may not worth the downtime. And there is no perfect shard key. So we decided like, um, it's better to keep the same shard key. Uh, it doesn't worth, worth the hassle. But what we did was we identified some query patterns that they were point queries or, or small ranges that they could use the, they could become targeted operations. So we created for those satellite collections that they were pretty much like materialized views, uh, but the application was responsible to update them. And we, we sharded on the key that the application was actually uh, using. And we sacrificed writes, obviously, because you need to keep them updated, but the write uh, overhead was very low for those, and space, because you have to, say, you have to keep them on disk, but with compression, uh, we didn't have to waste much to eliminate uh, the scatter gather operation. We always keep the reference to the parent collection uh, just in case uh, they wanted to perform a join. I don't know, joins are not allowed in Mongo. Um, and that's the actual migration or transition. It looks very complicated, but it's not. Uh, we just converted a node after another with some evaluation in the middle. And the evaluation had to do more like evaluate the, the read performance in our case. It's, it's very important, in my opinion, to avoid running a wire tiger primary and two MMAP secondaries as if you don't know what you're doing, right? As it's possible to face replication lags, a replication lag on your secondaries as the primary has the improved locking mechanism for writes, so it can absorb writes way faster than the secondaries. But again, um, you just convert a uh, secondary, then you evaluate, then you convert another secondary. You don't have to evaluate again because the both secondaries will run the same workload. You promote that to, sec to, to become the primary, you evaluate again, and then you decide, do I go like um, my, my entire three node replica set to Wire Tiger or I just roll back. And we completed the migration, right? We, we did that. Um, I don't know what is the most uh, attractive comment that you ever heard at, at your work or your university or whatever. Uh, but for me, the biggest recognition is when my work goes unnoticed, when I do something and nobody noticed it. And that was what the customer highlighted. We, I just updated the ticket at some point, say like, we are in WireTiger now, and they just replied, really, are we in WireTiger? Yeah, server status says we are, thank you. <laughs> so, but the story doesn't end there. We faced a couple of minor issues after that migration completed. The first came from the balancer. The balancer in Wire Tiger uh, is a little bit more aggressive. It doesn't use the secondary throttle that uh, MMAP is using. So uh, you might see uh, the balancing then go way faster, but uh, if you have a very busy 
uh, application, it might affect it. So what we did, we we just reverted that secondary throttle because we we noticed that um, there was some some disturbance within the windows, uh, but we didn't like the secondary throttle. So we start playing with all these uh, new parameters that Mongo provides. I think from 4.0 and onwards, uh, the range deleter batch delay uh, or the batch size both for balance and range deleter. So with those, we managed to find uh, the, the optimal mix uh, for each cluster, and we apply those and they, uh, we remove the um, secondary throttle. Obviously, we had balancing windows, but uh, some of the clusters were 24, uh, 24 hours busy. Now, um, in 4.2, we're also evaluating the flow control for these type of situations. Now. Uh, we we're running in a with dedicated hardware, uh, and we had like a very very unique uh, uh, case after we we, we switched to Wire Tiger. One of one of the hosts uh, rebooted. It happens. I mean, update the firmware or whatever, and it ended, ended up when it came back it was full of secondaries. I mean, obviously we had the same problem with MMAP, but as I said, MMAP the the reads are not a problem that the secondary primarily serves. Uh, in Wire Tiger, we noticed that this host is going a little bit more hot than the others. Um, so we decided that maybe it's a good idea to add priorities, which we rejected straight away because it, it was adding like tons of complexity to, to create priorities on over like 4,000 uh, shards. Uh, so we just created an automation, something like a Sentinel that goes and detects which uh, the, the mix of, of nodes on its cluster. and Says so like if that if the secondaries and the primaries are in balance, it does the appropriate step downs in order to balance things, and it takes into account as well the the profile of each shard. And we didn't get rid of the queries. I, I, I talked about like the dynamic queries; they were still there. They didn't vanish with Wire Tiger. We wish, but they didn't. So we we keep evaluating like new patterns all the time. Uh, we have to remove indexes because they have seasonal patterns. Uh, so we had the automations in place that they check uh, all the time the instances for new patterns. Uh, if we get like load alerts from an instance, uh, that automation automatically triggers and go and see if there's a new pattern. Uh, so we need a new index. Uh, quickly, what comes next? Uh, I talk about hybrid cloud and most probably cloud, public cloud at some point. Uh, we're working on version upgrades to get to 4.4 and keep an eye on Mongo 5 because it brings some exciting new things. All right, uh, any questions? I guess you can you can ask the questions through um, chat. That's why I I minimize the presenter mode so I can answer your questions. Um, in any case, um, you can you can reach me with a direct message um, on Bevy or uh, reach me on LinkedIn or uh, Twitter, um, and I, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, okay. All right. Um, perfect. If we don't have any questions, uh, I want to to thank you all uh, for for attending. I, I hope you um, you took something valuable over it. I mean, obviously, if you don't care about private cloud, uh, at least you you learn all the Octonauts lines now, so you can show off to your uh, friends. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, let's keep in touch. Just gonna remain for another two minutes on this on this um, channel, just in case you change your mind and you want to ask me something. I hope I can make the same presentation in a year from now about like how we transit from private cloud to hybrid cloud. 
which I think most of you will find way more interesting. Okay. I want to thank Sparkona also for having us and uh, thank you for organizing this amazing conference and I hope next year we can actually be in a, in a real room and have pints. <laughs>